feel uh, this is going to be a change up from the last presentation as uh, unfortunately I was not able to join my two colleagues in one of their capstone projects. Uh, I recently relocated and had to relocate out of state, uh, which would be an inconvenience to the teammates and it wouldn't have been fair to you. I would have loved to join on the pave or the heat, but uh, I had to ride solo for this capstone project. Uh, this project is going to be, as Dr. Mike would be proud of me, a qualitative research uh, assignment that I did. Um, I'll just give you a high level overview. The slides pretty much do the rest of the talking for me. So I'll just jump right into it to talk to you about uh, how this capstone came to be. Uh, May 2012, AT&T Learning Services was preempt. I'll talk about that a little bit uh, in slide four. And I was selected to be a senior manager trainer for the New England region to slide out of retail and to join the training program. Uh, what happened was well, I'll start the journey and we'll see what happened and how this capstone and why I started losing sleep and sleep and sleep. So, a quick agenda today. I'm going to give you a brief introduction. Uh, we're going to talk about at and Learning Services, the purpose of the study, a little field practice that I had to uh, start, my methodology, my research outcomes, my conclusions and recommendations, and future research that I have planned for. What questions do you have about the agenda? You have to wait seven seconds in training, that's how they teach you. Oh, 10 in yours, okay. So the big picture, the one key takeaway that I took from Dr. Mike was, you have gotta have a big picture. I wanted to research this, I wanted to research this, Maureen had no idea what I was researching, Trina looked at me like I had a different head, Dr. Fair, I was like, you need to get it together, you have seven more weeks. So I had to look at the big picture, and that's what Dr. Mike taught me. He said, any research project that you do, has to be part of a bigger picture, that has to be part of a bigger picture, and that has to be part of a bigger picture. So let's talk about this. The bigger picture. What do you know? You have the big four. T-Mobile, Verizon, AT&T, and Sprint. They are the major players in the game. According to NBI research, if all four companies were in this room, they put all their money on the table, they can put about $40 billion on the table between the four of them. Also, according to NBI research, by the end of the year 2015, they are going to make $72 billion in revenue. Does anyone want to guess where $48 billion of those dollars are coming from? Overseas. Consumers. And I don't know about you, but telecommunications is not going anywhere anytime soon. Who thinks they're going to get rid of their phone in the next few years? I'd like to. Don't worry, AT&T covers Armenia. We're the leading global telecommunications. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what got me thinking, well there's the big picture. So how does little old Chris in Framingham, Massachusetts, and little old Rumo 2 affect that bigger picture? And Dr. Mike also taught us to ask the five whys. Because I truly believe that the leader in the telecommunications race is going to be the one who gets the most money. And the other thing Dr. Mike looked at me and said, if you don't believe that money is the blood of an organization, you are kidding yourself. Because that money is just going to help us improve, it's going to help us be the best, and hopefully they'll give some money to the training department. So there's your big picture. So now you have learning services. This is just a high level overview of what our paradigm looks like right now. So right now, uh, excuse me, this was actually, uh, actually uh, May 2012 when Learning Services went through a complete overhaul to their organization. So before, Learning Services, I don't know where they were in the paradigm. I don't want to guess. They came up with a new vision, we only deliver the best. Now, does anyone want to know, maybe my at and coworker, why they had to revamp Learning Services in 2012? There's two main reasons. Hmm. Get, sort of grow the, the product knowledge of the company. Or just cross train. Cross train. Uh, it, it goes, it's one of those little dots on the umbrella that connects the big picture. The first one is actually the merger from T Mobile and ATT that got denied by the Department of Justice. Everyone remembers reading about that. Whatever your opinions are, that's for another research project. But regardless, ATT tried to acquire T Mobile to gain more spectrum, which will allow us to reach more customers in more areas. 
That was denied. So what did they decide to do? Leadership decided to look internal. Now what's the big phase that's happening globally right now? What are all companies moving towards? Making money. Making money. So how are we gonna how are we gonna make that money, Maureen? We have to go global. We have to go global. But I'll give you a little fact. There is no difference between these four companies and the devices that we offer. Our networks differ, maybe here and there on speeds and compat on compat compatibility. But the only difference is going to be the customer service. And if you haven't caught on to the customer service wave that corporations are embracing, it's happening. And boy, do we need to jump on it. So leadership decided to look inward and said, you know what? We're going to charge learning services. We need to adopt that servant leadership approach. We need to put customer needs first. Because that's who's going to get to the forefront of getting that big pie come 2015. And we want to stay a leader in communications. So under the paradigm, you have AT&T Learning Services, you have the wired paradigm, you have the mobility, which we support both, and we also support leadership, which supports us. So our vision, of course, has to be realistic. We only deliver the best. That's our motto for learning services. You come in, we'll deliver the best. This is WTR. Does anyone want to guess what that acronym means? Has anyone gotten a survey recently from their phone provider? Wow, you guys are going to go upgrade your phones for the holidays. That stands for willingness to recommend. Everything that we are measured on right now is our willingness to recommend AT&T to your friends and family. So learning services were charged with the, was charged with the duty of making willing to recommend. There's supposed to be more arrows here, but it just got too confusing to make willingness to recommend for AT&T. So that's where learning services and why it got revamped which leads me to the purpose of my study. I came into training, and Dr. B, you're gonna appreciate these next few slides. I wanted to improve engagement and retention of knowledge of all the participants that came through my class. I wanted to modify, not recreate the curriculum. I'm not here to recreate anything, because the curriculum is good. It just needs a little bit of modifications, which I'll talk about. I wanted to consider generational traits and adult learning theories, because I found in the curriculum they weren't Consider. I'll apply Gagne's theory to the curriculum. I'll get into Gagne's theory in a little bit. Hey, I wanted to put theory to practice. I've never done it before. I've always heard theory to practice, theory to practice, academia to business. Well, here's my opportunity. Proof retention increases. That's all I wanted to do. It is under my modification, under my modified curriculum, that I can increase retention of the participants that come through my class. So I had to do a little field practice. And before anything can be modified, you need to do a few things. First, I had to do some astute observations. I then had to research theory, and then I had to actually apply everything that I've witnessed, that I've researched, and that I've done. That's where modification can take place. So these were the steps that I took. First was my observations. Dr. B, can you tell us what that means? <laughs> Looking at the people and their behavior, what they actually do. That's what I did. And the best thing about having a technological observation approach was I didn't know how the previous learning services function, and I didn't know how the new one. So I was able to sit during my observations and actually be able to separate myself from the customs, the values, whatever else was going on. I had no idea how we were structured. All I knew was there was a person talking, people in front of these box thingies, and they weren't moving. And what Dr. B taught me, you got to pretend you're an alien coming from Mars, just sitting in the back of the room, and that's what you have to observe. Part of the observations were actually required of me. The first six weeks that I joined the program, two weeks you're required to go to Dallas to get trained on the curriculum, which I'll get into, and the next four weeks is observations, where you're sitting and you have to watch four trainers deliver the curriculum so that you can take notes, maybe co-teach, however you want to do it. So these observations actually came from four trainers that I actually observed in Framingham, Massachusetts, Allentown, New Jersey, Morristown, and Atlanta, Georgia. My observation conclusions. Out of all the observations, I took the commonalities of all four. The first one were participants are bound to their workstations. They didn't move. They were there from 8.30, they got a break, they came back, they went to lunch, they came back. 
High level observation, hey, maybe that's the customs of it. I don't know, I'm not here to judge. Trainers talk, participants don't. There's a lot of talking going on up here. Not a lot of talking going on with these little machines and these little people in front of these machines. Activities are optional. Trainers discretion. Okay. Capstone presentations lack creativity. I will touch on that later. Assessments are reviewed. So I thought it was common practice when I came to AT&T that before the assessment was given, there was a review that went over all the questions on the assessments, and then you go take the assessment. So I was like, oh, I guess that's how we do it here. I don't know. I guess that's what the curriculum says. The iPad is the sage on the stage. So all I knew is there was a person in front of the room, and they just continued looking at this. And this is the lesson, this is the lesson. I said, what is that little machine they have? It's like magical. It has like all the answers, I guess. I don't know. So these are my observations. Then I noticed a lot of generational traits. When I pulled numbers, I found that in the last year, Generation Y fits into the years um, where you could be 19 to I believe 34 is where they condensed it. 81% of our participants that came through new hire training were Generation Y. I was like, wow, that's a pretty interesting fact. So I decided to take a look at Generation Y traits in the classroom. They want lectures to be kept to a minimal. They are visual learners. They are sociable. They are competitive. They are creative. And they want instant feedback. That's what they want in the classroom. So I said, OK, let me parking lot that on my observations. Then I had to look at theory. So I said, knowing my observations, knowing I'm going to have to apply this, I started combing through the curriculum. And I brought the actual curriculum in. Unfortunately, I couldn't post the actual curriculum on my PowerPoint because I didn't get permission from my leaders. Uh, and I don't want to produce any copyright infringements today. So this is the actual curriculum that's delivered to our senior hires. So I started going through it. And if you can't see, I'll walk around. The blue text that you see is what the facilitator is required to say. I don't know about you, but that's a lot of words. So I started looking through this, and I said, wow. There's a lot of blue text in here, a lot of blue text in here, a lot of blue text in here. So I started wondering, OK, now knowing what I know from my observations, what theory supports it? I looked through 12 different theories of conditions of learning, and PSI, DOI. I can't even remember all the acronyms. My head's going to explode. But the one that really stuck with me was Gagne's Nine Steps of Conditional Learning. So I decided to research more on this theory. The reason why. And I'm going to, man, where's Dr. Mike today? I'm going to get him. So Dr. Mike taught me that for every research, there has to be a beginning book that started all the research. So if my research is up here, it has to refer back to that, which has to refer back to that, but that, that. Well, this guy, Gagne, kept coming up as being referred. So I took it as, man, he might be the first book on conditions of learning. And I found out that many of the other theories are derived from Gagne's. So I said, he might be a good Good candidate to take a look at. So these are basically the nine steps and conditions of learning. Again, a high level overview. First thing you gotta do is gain attention. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Then you need to inform of objectives. Stimulate recall of previous knowledge, present stimulus material, provide learner guidance, elicit performance, provide feedback. I'll talk about that in depth in a little bit. Assess performance and enhance retention and transfer. Again, there will be no quiz on this. Like the former uh, presenters, <laughs> this is a high level overview of what I looked at. So now that I have theory, I have a few research, I have observations, what do I do with it? Well, I gotta practice it. So, RSC Foundations, what we call RSC 118 t World. It is the four week program that all new hires have to go through when they join at t It's four weeks. Two weeks is instructional, instruction led, Third week, they're in the store. Fourth week, they're back for the instruction. It is a requirement to pass on to the front line. So my research only targets RSC Foundations. No other course. The only course that I looked at was RSC Foundations. I created a modified curriculum with same objectives. Like I said before, this is not Berg's curriculum. This is the client's curriculum, the client's objectives, and we need to meet the client's needs. But my reasoning was, if I'm meeting the objectives, and covering where all the client is, 
doesn't matter how I'm doing it, especially if I know I can prove retention. The next thing I did was I had to establish control groups to measure, which I'll talk about in a little bit. And I met client's objectives. I believe I met them. I believe my research backs that up, which I will show you. So here's my methodology. I formed two groups. Control, I named them A and B. <laughs> the first group took a place from 10-8 to 10-2, four weeks, REC foundations. Second one, group B, was from the 5th to the 30th. What do they all have in common? I taught both of them for all four weeks. So I was able to actually do the practice and the application part. What else do they have in common? They both had 15 participants. Perfect. <coughs> oh, what else did they have in common? Every single participant was a member of Generation Y. I actually did four, but the other two I threw out because of time constraints, and I didn't have time to research all the different generational traits. I kept it exact. They both were held in Framingham Mass in the same exact room. The class setup was identical. When I say identical, where the posters were for the first class, the posters were for the second class. I got so bad where I started wearing the same ties on the same days because I did not want any problems with my surroundings or my atmosphere. The assessments were given to both groups, day five and day 10. Fridays, end of week one on Friday, end of week two on Friday. Same exact, the assessments were 20 questions, same exact. I didn't deviate from anything. So here's my control group. Control group A, on week one, I used the design scheme, the exact curriculum as it was written. I did not deviate it from it one bit. If that was the text I had to read, that was the text I had to read. If that was the activity, that's the activity that I did. And then on day five, I gave him the assessment. However, in week two, I used my annotated copy, my modified curriculum that was based on Gagne's nine steps of conditional learning that I implemented into the curriculum. And then I administered week two's test. What questions do you have about this? Am I losing anybody? Maureen's OK? No? OK. I'll save questions for after. We'll park it about that. Group B, guess what I did? Same exact thing, except I reversed it. I used Gagne's week one, and then I used AT&T's week two. But again, I did not deviate from the curriculum. So for control group B that was held in November, all I did was switch the way I facilitated the curriculum for my modification from AT&T's. So these are actually, and I apologize for the words, these are exact excerpts from my notes on my iPad for my modified curriculum based on, nine condition, uh, based on the nine steps of conditional learning. This happens to be from day four, lesson one. And what I wrote to myself was gaining attention. I need to start the experience by gaining the attention of the audience. This, will, this change in stimulus alerts the group that learning will soon take place. Voice, gesturing, video, topic of instruction, whatever it is, this was my guide. In the blue is how I considered the generational trait that was in front of me. I said, who can tell me about an extraordinary dining experience they had yesterday? Because they all would fly in or they would all travel and be staying in a hotel, so they all had to eat out. And we would talk about extraordinary. Oh, so tell me about who did not have an extraordinary. Little did they know, my agenda that day was AT&T customer roles. And all I did was, oh, so they didn't make it seamless, they didn't do it right, they didn't take ownership, and all I did was start plugging the AT&T rules into the next lesson. They were already telling me. The next thing I did was do a visual agenda. I don't know about you, but what drives me crazy, and I did it tonight, I'm a hypocrite. I hate agendas up here. You need to write them out on a flip chart. And if you don't believe me, personalize it. They'll appreciate it. Uh-oh. Can't jump to research yet. <laughs> Figure two, this was lesson two. Four members of the objective, the expectancy. Again, these are my notes to myself, so I have to be on those willingness to recommend scores. Activity, pre-chartered agenda, agenda shown. This is where Dr. Mike would be proud of me, about the five whys. So what I would have is, before they came in, everything was pre-charted. There was never any activity going on where I was actually filling out the charts. They came into that environment already. So for this lesson, it was on willingness to recommend, and who cares? My favorite statement, statement how do you say that, Maureen, again? Sir? How do you say that again? With them. What's in it for me? With them. What's in it for me? 
Because I'll tell you right now, if you don't believe Generation Y wants to know what's in it for me, what do I care? You better tell them. Because that's a big thing. They want instant feedback and gratification. So what I did is I charted five flip charts, and I called it the five lies. So 15 participants, three groups of five. You go there, you go there, you go there. First group, why is willing to recommend important? Because of this, okay? Then the next group had to build on why that's important, and why that's important, why that's important. And what do you know? You start digging a little deeper, and now you have self-exploration. Uh, so now they understood how important it was, and it was their words, their teachbacks. They weren't in front of these little boxes and me telling them why it was so important today. Generation Y trait is instantaneous gratification. Next one, and I didn't put everyone on here, these are just excerpts. Again, stimulating we call prior learning. Hey, what about all that other stuff they learned? What about day three and day two, isn't that important? It all has to tie together. It all has to come together. So I created a waterfall teach back. Where, hey, guess what? Break up into groups. You're going to do a billboard. You could do a newspaper. You could do a rap. You could do whatever you want. You just have to teach back to the class about what we've learned and what we're about to learn so they can connect the dots for me. Again, they're up and moving. Creativity, as long as it's COBC, I was okay with it. Generation Y wants competition. Guess what? Award points to them. Where did I have the best one? I gave points to. I skip over to step seven, and I'm going to come back to this because this was the only objection I had to Gagne's uh, nine steps of conditional learning. And the reason why is Gagne actually believed that the best way to provide coaching and feedback, especially after role plays, because we would do role plays on customer interactions, was to do it after all the role plays were completed. And that was something I was very much against because I believe in instant coaching, instant behavior correction, and fixing it, and then moving on. You need to stop doing this behavior, and you need to start doing this. What good does it tell, especially a generation wire, who needs that instant feedback to tell them after they've gone? So this is where I step in, and how I started changing the curriculum, which I will get into how I was selected to develop a curriculum going forward. So what were my results after all of this stuff here were my results for week one and week two. So control group A, and if you notice the star, that's when the modified curriculum was used. What I used for Gagne's nine steps of conditional learning. So week one, control group A, the average score was an 84% out of the 15 participants. For control group, control group B, they were used uh, with my modified, control group A was only 18T, theirs was 96.6%. A little difference. Then when I switched it up and gave week two with the modified, they scored 89.7, and group B e scored 85.3. I'm a genius, no, I'm just kidding. These are all just <laughs> preliminary numbers. Then what I did is I said, okay, what's that? That's great. How do you test retention after the big training? So then I administered the same exact assessments that they gave, that I gave them in week one, week two, 30 days after they left training. And they actually all agreed to help me out on this. So, control group A, remember them who had the first week, who didn't have any uh, modified curriculum, their average score was a 77.8. So they still knew about 77% of the concepts. But look at group B, they scored a 95%, 30 days out, when I gave them the modified curriculum. And then vice versa, group uh, A was 88.4% for week two, when my modified, group B went down to 80%. At, at any point, whether during the training, before and during, after, were they told about any of this? No. Okay. <laughs> I kept it because A, I feared my leaders, because uh, they knew I was up to something, but the more I explained it, they'd be like, no, you can't Did anyone that. in the classes question a different change in your style, or, or make note of it? Uh, a few people did. Um, that was my recommendations uh, that I had coming up for my, my next run at this. Uh, so I will park and walk that, Dr. Farrell. So these were my conclusions initially. General traits, uh, excuse me, general, generational traits need to be considered. Observations, lit reviews, and applications support claim. Gagne's theory proves to be a credible template. I don't know if it proves retention. All I knew is it proved retention for those specific assessments for that specific time. And I used his template. 
Retention increases during and post training. I only measure 30 days. And modifications will benefit the current curriculum. Again, I'm not looking to change it. I'm looking to take what I've learned and start maybe sweeping some of this in here to get people off their feet and learning. Recommendations. One of the recommendations I had was, should I tell people? Or if someone says, hey, this seems a little different, I don't know. I don't know if that would impact the research. Uh, a lot of the participants started like, wow, we're moving around a lot this week, Chris. I was like, yeah, it's just the way the curriculum's written, which was true, but it was my curriculum almost. So I don't know. I left it on my capstone paper a little bit more in detail where any comments will be greatly appreciated from anybody. Um, my recommendations, what I would change for next time, consider surroundings during the next application. I noticed on the scores, when the week one came in and I did the ATT curriculum, I didn't consider their needs. A lot of these people are coming in brand new to the job. This may be their first job. They all don't know each other. They're nervous. And here I am, not moving them around, not getting them up and moving, following the curriculum to the T. I need to consider their needs. So maybe week one, it both has to be implemented. Or week one should be implemented, or maybe a lesson or a day. But I felt like the first group, the reason why the scores were so miscued is uh, I really put one or the other. I don't know. But uh, that, that, that was a key takeaway from But it. that's how it's given to everyone else. Right. Right? Yeah. So you're doing, what you're, you're doing what the book tells you to do. Yes. I like doing that. Uh, video recorder observer to prove no deviation. Um, how do you know I didn't deviate? I'm just telling you I did. So maybe having a camera that actually watches me or someone or a colleague of mine that can actually follow me in the curriculum to know that I didn't deviate from it. Eliminate mandatory PowerPoint clause. This drives me nuts. They, have to perform, they actually have to present a capstone project, a new hire training, 15 minute presentation about key concepts that they learned. A PowerPoint is mandatory. Yikes. Okay. Some activities should not be optional. I understand time management. I'm a time burglar as well. Activities should not be optional. There should be some as far as teachbacks, as far as <coughs> lesson reviews, that should not be optional. Follow up needed to measure WQR, that's the next step, is I need to measure willing to uh, willingness to recommend. Are they impacting business? And can I put numbers to that? Do not conduct research in November because willingness to recommend is turned off in December. Because when you go in to buy a phone, it might be a gift, they'll send a survey, now the person knows they got a new phone. So we turn those off, they're not counted. So I don't know where my numbers are going to be for this November class. So I know for next time, maybe not put a big focus on the class in November. And then change the seven step of Gandhi theory. I don't like his method of coaching. I don't agree with it. It doesn't support generational traits. It doesn't support what we're trying to do in learning services. That would be my modification. The future, this is just a Quick overview. Currently, has anyone ever heard of Prezi? Oh, Dr. Farrow, you have. Uh, can you give us a little overview of what it is? A more dynamic type of PowerPoint, more dynamic type of presentation. It is. Has anyone ever seen uh, Prezi in action? Well, the good news what Prezi is, is the reason why I like Prezi is because it supports generational wide traits. Generation Y wants to personalize, they want to be creative, they want to be imaginative. I like it. Currently, at t Learning Services and I, we've reached out to Prezi. We're actually trying to get templates uploaded to Prezi that actually focus on at t We are trying to get 20 to 25 at t templates where they can have participants. So what Prezi does is just another way of looking at PowerPoint. So this was one of my participants who loved pirates. Hey, Generation Y, it's important to him, it's important to me. No problem. So, what you do at Prezi is it's just an interactive map. Capstone Project, how to find the hidden treasure. And all it does, like Corey Morrison, I should take his name out, but I'll give him kudos. So here's a ship. Our map division. Connect people with their world everywhere they live and work and do it better than anyone else. There's our company vision. Bring you around. Follow the five key behaviors. There they are. He puts them on the map. Getting off the path means fighting with the natives. The black spot. 
I said, what's the black spot? He goes, you know when those reps are doing this in the store, and they make the black spot with their soles and their shoes? That's the black spot. I said, I like it. Staying behind the dash, show the leg. You know, the, when you come in, hey, you need help with anything today? I drive you crazy. Yeah, the ordinance, as I call it. Not walking customers to the door, ignoring customers. And then what I really liked, laying you up, doing a little bit extra, that's what we use, staying out of Davy Jones' locker. How do you do it? 90% effort, I like it, you walk the plank. 100% effort, walk the plank, give 120. And all this is, and this was what was important to him, becoming a small business specialist. This is just an all interactive map where it points out everything. I don't touch it. It's their creativity, it's what's important to them, and you watch them deliver the PowerPoint presentation on this, it is night and day. So that's what I chose to look at for Prezi. This is what I implement in my new hire classes right now. So, just to wrap this up, because I'm sure he is uh, saying, come on, Berg, hurry this up. Uh, coaching for performance. Uh, iPad, this usually happens in my class as well. I put it down, I'm like, where did it go? Um, lesson seven about instant coaching. When I decided to come on this crusade, uh, I noticed that coaching was inconsistent on the training level because trainers wear three different hats. We're managers, we're facilitators, and we're also coaches. And a lot of our trainers right now in the organizations do not know how to coach participants. Because my, that vision statement says, we only deliver the best. So that, does that mean when all 15 participants come through, everyone graduates? There's going to be one or two. Healthy attrition. Jack Welch talked about it. And there's better believe that there's healthy attrition in my class, because that's my reputation on the line. So I developed, and I helped a team develop a new curriculum that I'm presenting to leadership on Friday in Dallas, Texas. That's all on coaching for performance. It is written. I worked around the clock, and I have to give so much kudos to the other seven people who helped me. I drove all the way around New England, so I would have the finished product to just be able to show you on the iPad. This is all Berg's work that was put in. The design team helped put it in. Guess what? Pictures, generational traits in there, and it's based on Gagne's nine steps of conditional learning, except I don't have to separate the text in there. So this was my baby, this is my finished product that I hopefully will be delivering in 2013 on a national level to all the trainers. 2013 team objectives is keep looking at RSC foundations. How can we make it more engaging? How can I help? How can design team all come together? More control groups, I need more research. Simple as that. I need more research, I need 60 days, I need 90 days, I need impact on business numbers to put validity. And I'm guessing I'm going to have less sleep. Uh, mm -hmm. than I really do now if I continue on this crusade. That being said, what really stuck with me in uh, the leadership series or the leadership organization, when I saw that triangle flipped over on an inverse triangle that said, we need to serve the customers first, that blew me away. Maybe it was my corporate greenwash mindset at the time, but I was like, impossible. Customers first, money, 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 I, I get it now. I fought servant leadership more than anyone in this room. Fought it. I thought it was a fairy tale about some bogus, unicorn-like leadership concept. But the more I fought it, the more I realized that's who I was. And that's what at and needs. So customers' needs will come first, not bosses. That is my commitment to all my, to all my participants and leaders. And I would say the servant leader has entered the center of the paradigm. Because my gosh, if I enter, I'm not going anywhere. And lastly, that's supposed to be a heart, because great service comes from the heart. It doesn't matter what class you take in this leadership program, moral leadership, cultural anthropology, creative, whatever it is, it's got to come from in here. It's who you are in here. And just like we discussed moral leadership, it starts in the high chair. If you're successful at raising people in the high chair, you keep them out of the electric chair. That's what I'm going to do to my new hires, because they are going to deliver on willingness to recommend, and I believe I can change this company's mindset. I am that not on the street. I know it, but I like it. And in closing, this is the end, and if you have any questions.